Hi everyone and welcome to the Oasis Global Gathering. If this is your first time or if you're a regular attender, feel free to post a greeting in the chat function to let everyone know that you're joining us today. For those of you who've been following us over the last few weeks, you'll know that we took a short pause from our current series last week to hear from Brian McLaren about his new book, Faith Beyond Doubt. It's well worth a listen, so if you did miss out, do consider going back at some point to catch up. Today we're going to resume our current series, Nevertheless, She Persisted, where female speakers from across Oasis Church Waterloo and Oasis Church Bath will be retelling and exploring the stories of women from the Bible. Today we're going to hear from Leanne and she's going to share her thoughts with us about the story of Rahab. But first, in our Connect slot, we're going to hear from Jo Dolby, hub leader of Oasis Bath, and she's going to tell us about their impact report, which they've recently released. Details about how you can access this report will be in the video, so do consider having a pen handy. Hi, I'm Jo and I'm the hub leader at Oasis in Bath. I just wanted to take a couple of minutes to tell you about our brand new 2020 impact report. The impact report is something that we've committed to producing at the start of every year. It looks back at the year just gone and it tries to measure the impact or the difference that we're making in people's lives through the community work that we deliver as Oasis Hub Bath. Oasis UK also produce an impact report every year and we loved that idea and wanted to produce something more local. We would love it if you give the report a read and let us know what you think. So there are three ways that you can access it. The first is to send us an email to welcome at oasisbath.org and we will send you your very own PDF copy that you can download and read. Secondly, you can visit the link that's currently on the screen and that will take you to our issue page where you can view the file in full, definitely hit full screen. And you can also look at previous editions of Hub News, which is our community work newsletter. Finally, if you'd prefer to have a paper copy, we'd be really happy to send you one in the post when we get ours printed in a couple of weeks' time. Again, just email us at welcome at oasisbath.org. It's an amazing collection of stories, testimonies, facts and figures, and I guarantee there will be something in there that you don't know about the work that Oasis do in Bath. So please do give it a read. And if you'd like to, please share it as well using the issue link, as we'd love for more people to hear about the work of Oasis in Bath. Thanks Jo for sharing that with us. It's really exciting to hear about all the work going on in Oasis Hub Bath, but particularly to be able to read about the impact that it's having. If you are part of Oasis Hub Bath, there's a community forum tonight at 8pm on Zoom and you are warmly invited to attend. Next week on Sunday the 7th of March, it's the church forum for Oasis Church Waterloo. Again, that's at 8pm on Zoom. Next, we're going to have our Bible reading for today from Joshua chapter 2. It's read for us by Ben Senek from Bath, and straight after that, we'll be hearing from Leanne. Joshua chapter 2, verses 1 to 14. Then Joshua son of Nun secretly sent two spies from Shethim. Go, look over the land, he said, especially Jericho. So they went and entered the house of a prostitute named Rahab and stayed there. The king of Jericho was told, look, some of the Israelites have come to look, spy out the land. So the king of Jericho sent this message to Rahab. Bring out the men who came to you and entered your house, because they have come to spy out the whole land. But the woman had taken the two men and hidden them. She said, Yes, the men came to me, but I did not know where they had come from. At dusk, when it was time to close the city gate, they left. I don't know which way they went. Go after them quickly. You may be able to catch up with them. But she had taken them up to the roof and hidden them under the stalks of flax she had laid out on the roof. So the men set out in pursuit of the spies on the road that leads to the fords of the Jordan. And as soon as the pursuers had gone out, the gate was shut. 
Before the spies lay down for the night, she went up to the roof, and she said to them, I know that the Lord has given this land to you, and that a great fear of you has fallen on us, so that all sh who live in this country are melting in fear because of you. We have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt, and what you did to Sion and Og, the two kings of the Amorites east of the Jordan, whom you completely destroyed. When we heard of it, our hearts sank, and everyone's courage failed because of you. For the Lord your God is God in heaven above and on the earth below. Now then, please swear to me by the Lord that you will show kindness to my family, because I have shown kindness to you. Give me a sure sign that you will spare the lives of my father and mother, my brothers and sisters, and all who belong to them, and that you will save us from death. Our lives for your lives, the men assured her. If you don't tell what we are doing, we will treat you kindly and faithfully when the Lord gives us the land. So we have two spies in the story of Rahab. And it seems to me that there's two ways that you can tell their part in it. So you could talk about how they were Israelites, how they were specially chosen from all the Israelites camped outside the city waiting to invade, perhaps picked because of some extensive experience in espionage in recent missions. But if you look at the story another way, I think you could say that these are possibly the worst spies in the history of spying. Verse 1 tells us that they were indeed sent into Jericho on a secret mission. But then comes the second part of verse 1, which says, So they went and entered the house of a prostitute named Rahab, and they lay there. So the very first thing they do on their secret mission to Jericho is head to a brothel. They had one job to do, to find out about Jericho, and they choose to prostitute a woman first, and it nearly ruined everything. Because in the very next verse, we read that the king of Jericho already knows where they are. We're only on verse two of the story, and these second-rate spies have already been reported to the king and found out. So were they highly skilled in espionage? Or were they the worst spies in history? And what about Rahab? How can her story be told? Well, history has mostly judged her to be a liar and a sex worker, and that's about it. Certainly when I spoke to people about who I was talking about, the most common response was, was she the one that lied to, or um, is she the prostitute one? See, for the spies, their presence in the brothel gets glossed over and given explanations of why they might have been there, but that's never afforded to Rahab. In every translation I looked at, the way that Rahab made her money to survive and support her family is right there. Rahab the harlot was the most popular one. Rahab the prostitute. And one was right in there with Rahab the whore woman. Hers is the story of a non-Jewish female sex worker who literally lived in the margins of her society. You see, Rahab lived in the city of Jericho, which had two walls around it. It had an outer wall that went round the whole city to protect it from intruders, and then an inner wall which separated a central zone where the temples um, and the palace and the main food stores would have been. And the more important and the more money you had, the closer you lived to the centre while the poor and disreputable were pushed further out to the edges of the compound. And for Rahab, she was living so far into the edges and the margins of her city that the text says that she was literally living inside the city wall. And we know that she was living a lifestyle that it's hard to imagine that she would have chosen for herself, given the option. So at the point where we join her in the story, the group of Israelites are camped outside the city of Jericho and the battle to take over Jericho and to claim it for the Israelites was imminent. Joshua's PR team had been at the top of their game recently 
and stories about this army and their god who had uh, dried up the Red Sea and annihilated kings in their path had spread around to people's ears and people were afraid. And then one night, quite unbelievably, two men from this lurking army knock on Rahab's door. I imagine she invites them in, makes sure they're well looked after. And uh, then there's another knock at the door with messengers from the king telling her to bring out the men who'd come to spy on the land. And at this point, at this point, we get to watch how Rahab lies to the messengers that the spies had already left the city. We listen to her demonstrate shrewdness as she negotiates a package of safety for herself and her family when the battle finally comes. And we watch her leadership as she gives quick, clear instructions to the spies of where to go and how long to stay there to be safe. The spies then give Rahab a red cord to tie in her window as a sign to the invaders to leave that house alone. And through her quick thinking, her negotiations and her leadership skills, theologian Will Gaffney describes how Rahab turned her whorehouse into an ark of safety. The very place where sex was bought and sold ended up being the place where lives were saved and where yet another step towards the liberation of the people of God happened. I've heard Rahab described as Jericho's Harriet Tubman. Because Rahab was so much more than a liar and so much more than a prostitute. And just like there were very two different versions of the story around the spies, there are very different versions of Rahab's story told. On the one hand, she was an outsider. She had sex with people to survive. She lied to save herself and her family and she was a traitor to the rest of her city. And in the book of Joshua, these things are true, but they're not the only chapters in her story. Rahab is also mentioned in the New Testament. In the letter to Hebrews, it recognises the strength of her faith that saved the lives of her and her family, her faith in a God that she barely knew, a faith in a God that she'd only caught stories of. She hadn't seen angels, she hadn't had bright light stopping her in her tracks, but something in her sensed that the God of the Israelites was worth trusting. And the letter to the Hebrews commends that faith. In the New Testament letter from James, she's described as righteous. And we were never called to be perfect. We were called to live faithfully and to live rightly. And she's mentioned in Matthew's Gospel. And she's there just with her name this time, not her profession, just with her name in that list of Jesus's family line. It's that list of awkward, unlikely heroes, because if God was waiting for perfect people to carry the story on, then the Bible would have been a very short book. The Bible is full of imperfect heroes. God sees their weaknesses, their faults, and the things they have to do to survive and uses them to move the story of liberation forward. Amidst everything else, God saw Rahab's faith her courage, her leadership, her ability to negotiate and used her um, and he used her to clear the path for the people, the Israelites, to have their promised land. And so she plays her part in treading down the path for Jesus. Rahab was never ruled out of the bigger story because she wasn't perfect. We are not called to be perfect. When Miriam, no, when Rebecca, sorry, spoke on Miriam and the midwives two weeks ago, she ended up with a challenge about what are the injustices that we see in front of us and that we can no longer ignore. And I think Rahab hands us a strong reminder that we don't need to wait until we are better than we are now before we can start trying to make a difference in whatever big or small way presents itself to us. We don't have to be perfect before we try and be the salt and light in the places where we find ourselves. There is so much more that we can learn from the story of Rahab, but this time I've been particularly struck 
by the different ways there are to tell her story. And the same is true for us. Sometimes other people try and tell our story for us, but Sometimes they just keep on retelling chapters that are old. Even when we've got new chapters of new directions and fresh starts, sometimes people still insist on telling the old stories about us that aren't true anymore. And there's not much more we can do other than to just keep being the best that we can. And then there's the stories that we tell about ourselves. As people, we have this strong need for stories to be complete. So when we don't have all the information, then we tend to make up the missing parts. And then unfortunately, we tend to use our own insecurities and our own fears to write those stories onto. I know I found myself doing that more and more during lockdown. I find myself coming off of a Zoom meeting or a conversation or even sometimes just sending an email. And then all these thoughts start rushing through my head. It's like, oh, I didn't come across very well in that or... I didn't say enough, people are going to think I'm really stupid, or oh, I said too much, I bet that was really annoying for everyone else. And there are stories that we tell ourselves, and we have to learn to catch them and recognise them and be able to tell what's real and what's just made up from our own insecurities. And finally, there's the story that God says about us. And Rahab is a huge reminder of this. She was an outsider to everyone that knew and judged her. But that is not what God saw when he looked at her. She was an outrageously loved woman, created in the indelible image of God, who showed great courage and wisdom and faith. And whatever we have done, or whatever we're still doing, we are still part of this much bigger story and we are each made with that indelible image of God within us. There are different ways to tell a story. So let's tell the good stories about each other. Let's keep a check on the stories that we're telling about ourselves. And let's remember that God isn't waiting for us to sort ourselves out. We were never called to be perfect. We are known and we are loved just as we are. And anything that we know we need to change in us, well, that can be gently worked out along the way. Thanks so much, Leanne, for that thought-provoking talk. It was another reminder of the vital role that women have played in the story of the Bible, but also of the valuable lessons that their lives can teach us. We are accepted and we are loved just as we are. And God wants to go on display in and through our lives, despite all of our imperfections. Before we finish today, let's take a moment to consider what this means for our lives today. In her book, The Rhythm of Prayer, Sarah Bessie writes a beautiful reflection on exactly what we've been talking about today. I'd like to share some of it with you now. And if you choose to, you might want to think and reflect upon the sentences which particularly resonate with you. You don't have to be productive and you don't have to change the world. You're already so loved. You don't have to be smart, you don't have to be simple. You don't have to read all the right books by the right people. You're already so loved. You don't have to be beautiful and thin with an articulated and ironic fashion sense. Not at all. But if you're into that kind of thing, well, that's OK, too. You don't have to be healthy in your mind or in your body. You don't have to be in full time vocational ministry. You can watch horrible television or you can be proud of your televisionless home. You can be artistic or scientific. You can spend your life traveling to meet beautiful people or you can live and die in the town where you were born. You don't have to conform to someone else's ideas of holy or acceptable. You can be from the wrong side of the tracks or the gated community, suburbs or urban or rural. You can work with your hands and your mind, your back and your brain. You don't have to be educated, not at all. 
You don't have to have a degree or letters after your name. You don't have to know the right people and boast a carefully curated Instagram feed with the famous and the beautiful and the influential. You don't have to be conservative and you don't have to be liberal. You don't have to identify with certain political persuasions or ideology on sexuality or science or social economics or foreign policy. You can be a social justice warrior or, you know, not. None of that matters. None of that moves the metre of your belovedness. God won't say, OK, now I love her just a bit more because, look, she's finally out of debt or thin or powerful or influential or tireless. Your family story can be beautiful or terrible, or like most of us, a bit of both. Perhaps you're famous or well-known or influential, that's okay. Perhaps you're quiet and unknown, maybe you hate that, maybe you love it. You don't have to be a mother or a father, you don't have to be married, you don't have to be single, you don't have to want children or raise children, you don't have to be sober or clean. You don't have to give away everything you own and take a vow of poverty. You don't have to be prosperous either. Church or no church, or a certain kind of church only, whatever. You can doubt or feel great certainty, even if that certainty is in your doubt. You can believe in God, doubt God, seek God. You're already so loved. You aren't earning a breath of love or tenderness more than what you already have just by breathing, just by existing, just by being here in the wonder. Your name is already written in the lines of the hands of the universe, your star breath of dust, and you are beloved, intimately, faithfully, wholly. It's your lifelong rock. You are known. You are loved with delight and abundance, with choice and desire, with covenantal love. You may feel it or not. You are so loved. You are so loved. You are so loved. Mother God, Father God, may we know this. May we understand this. May we walk this and may we be this. We are loved. Amen. We're going to finish today's global gathering with the song You Are Love. So thank you so much for joining us this week and we hope you can join us again next time for our Oasis Global Gathering.
I'm